Hello guys, uh, today we come back to the uh, statistical learning theory formalization. So we start with all this um, theory, all, this, um, all those theoretical guarantees for supervised learning. Supervised learning. So uh, I'm going to, to start with uh, a very simple and, and first idea about the statistical learning theory. Let's suppose we have inside this um, rectangle or square all possible functions in nature and I'm going to call this space F all. The space containing all functions in the universe. And when I define a given supervised learning algorithm, I define a bias. A bias F. So this is the space of admissible functions, admissible functions, aka bias. So this is also known as bias. Okay? So the basic idea is that inside this space I have all functions my algorithm is capable of representing. For example, let's suppose the perceptron. If we take the perceptron, it will be capable of representing every possible linear function. So it is given by a single neuron which receives some inputs so here it comes like a given input here another one here another one and all those are multiplied by weights as you guys may may remember or know because you've seen before if you haven't i uh, i suggest you guys to study this beforehand okay and here i have some theta to change the interception point of this hyperplane that's going to be built inside the perceptron. And here we have some output. Let's write like this, output. So when I define the perceptron, I am defining here a bias, a linear bias. So I am going to consider every possible linear function inside this space of admissible functions. Inside it, we have one of those functions which is the best as possible function inside this bias. This function is referred here as lowercase f of uppercase f, where uppercase f uh, remains like an, an, uh, as an, an indication of my space of admissible functions, as you guys may notice here. So, of course, the whole idea is I should be capable of finding the best function inside this bias. This function, this best function, is the one that minimizes, minimizes arg minimal, okay, of the risk of all functions that lie inside this space, f, uppercase f. So if I consider every function f inside this space of the admissible functions uppercase f and I minimize in terms of the expected, remember this is the expected risk or the risk measured or the risk or the risk, let's change like this, or the risk measured on the JPD, on the joint probability distribution, if I had access to every possible input and output for a given problem, so I would be able to find the best as possible function inside this space. The simple problem I have here is there is no way of computing the expected risk. Why not? Because in order to compute the expected risk, I should have access to the joint probability distribution. The problem is, if I, if I 
I work like with a, a very sm a toy uh, scenario or a very naive example. I could I could know the joint probability distribution, but that's not the case when I work with real world problems. Why not? Because I receive some inputs x. I receive the those expected outputs y and I started building up the joint probability distribution in terms of data that I've been receiving, for example, along the data collection. So there is no way, especially if uh, my problem accepts an infinite number of inputs and an infinite number of outputs, of course an infinite number of different inputs and an infinite number of different outputs, it turns out to be impossible to come up with um, uh, a a priori joint probability distribution. This is the case. I mean, you you might have like some toy scenarios, such as when throwing a die. We we talked about that before. Okay, when you throw a die, you're gonna have like something with a predefined JPD where you know what's happening, you know what to expect, and that becomes of course easier to deal with. But when you deal with uh, a real world problem, that that's not going to happen. Okay. In our scenario, we need some way of finding the best function inside this space. And Vopnik, this Russian guy, took advantage of some, some a priori formalizations. So this Russian guy started working around 1965 with the statistical learning theory and he thought, okay, I could use some, uh, some tools, some probably some theoretical tools, theoretical tools, to start my formalization. So he came across to the law with the law of large numbers, of large numbers. And the law of large numbers tells me something that's really, really neat and, and quite interesting. The idea behind the law of large numbers is I can prove the convergence of an average over a given variable according to the realizations of that variable, this is going to approach the expected value of the same variable, okay, as the sample size tends to infinity. As uh, when I collect more and more data and I measure this average, it's going to approach the expected value of the same variable. Okay, this is the idea behind the law of large numbers, and it's quite interesting. And maybe we could take advantage of this to have to find a very nice uh, estimation for the expected risk. So that was the, basically the idea that Vapnik had at the beginning. So his idea was trying maybe to compute some empirical risk of a given classifier and measure if it could approach the expected loss of that classifier. The expected loss of that classifier. As we've seen before, this expected loss of a given classifier, it is indeed the expected risk. So his idea was, is it possible to prove this, that maybe a estimation, a risk estimation on a given sample could approach the expected risk in the whole population. Besides, I don't have access to the joint probability distribution function as the sample size tends to infinity. So that was his, basically his idea. Okay, as you might remember, the empirical risk 
is actually an average, is actually an average of losses. So here I have a loss function or an error function. And here I can measure my loss for every example from 1 to n. Here I have the input space of that particular example, what I expect for that particular example. And then the result produced by my classification function f. And I know my expected risk for the same function f is equal to the expected value of the loss function. Here, given every possibility of x, y, and the outputs of my classifier for this particular x, that I hope to be y, of course, the result of x applied on uh, f applied on x, I expect to be y. Of course, this is a representation without indices, just because I'm, I'm, I'm just considering the whole space in which we have every possibility for inputs and, of course, for the resultant outputs. Those are the empirical risk and the expected risk. So his idea was, is it possible to prove that this approaches this as my sample size tends to infinity? Yes, it is. It is, but I have to have some conditions. I have to hold some conditions. First of all, the law of large numbers is only respected if my data is collected in an independent and identically distributed manner. So that that means that I I if I start if I have like some joint probability distribution, for example, I have like it doesn't matter, it could be a Gaussian function in this space, for example. Okay? And this joint probability distribution could be like a Gaussian function. When I collect samples from here, all those samples are collected with the same probability they have in terms of this function. And if I select one over here, I'm not going to bias the next selection in terms of the previous. So if I selected something, a given input x with its expected output over here, I'm not, I'm not going to select something from this region of the data distribution of, or maybe this region or maybe that region. I have the same chance of selecting any, any of those pairs x and y from any place of this distribution. You, you guys are going to see that this is the same as ensuring that my selection is random and uniform in terms of my joint probability distribution. Random and uniform in terms of my joint probability distribution. There is another point. My joint probability distribution has to be fixed, has to be static. This means it cannot change. It cannot change. If it changes, if I have a, da a data distribution over here that moves moves a long time maybe or moves in some way this is not going to work why because i cannot guarantee convergence in such scenario there is another very very important point to mention the function being computed cannot be biased cannot be biased toward data cannot be biased toward data. This means something quite interesting. This means that, for example, when we talk about the law of large numbers, we are talking about an average that approximates the expected value of this variable. This average wasn't selected because of data. It, 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 it is basically independent. It was selected independent from data. But here we've got a problem. We've got an issue. When an algorithm learns 
it's going to adapt the classification function towards towards data so somehow it's going to be biased toward data and he had i mean he vapnik had to deal with that in of course he we have like some things to mention here some very interesting things let's go back to that space where we have all those functions from the universe and here we have an algorithm bias f let's select like like out of the blue a single function from here like f1 this is going to be my first function first classification function to be selected and then the question is can i can i ensure that my empirical risk is going to approach my expected risk if f1 was selected independently from my data am i am i being am i being um am i um satisfying this criterion yes i am satisfying because the function wasn't selected be, be, because of data if i am sure that the jpd is fixed i am indeed guaranteeing this and if i sample data from that jpd in an independent in an identical and independent manner i am indeed guaranteeing this too so yes the question the answer is yes i can ensure that as my sample size tends to infinity this is going to be the case yes that's true this is going to work this is quite interesting so we can satisfy the law of large numbers if i select a single function inside my bias without considering my data just out of the blue like just selecting without any criterion can i ensure the law of large numbers yes and there is something quite quite interesting when i can uh, employ the law of large numbers the point is the law of large numbers tells me that the divergence i have between the this expected risk minus the empirical risk for this function that was selected out of the blue like without considering my data its divergence in absolute value as you guys can see here being greater than some epsilon is indeed um upper bounded by two times the exponential value of minus two and epsilon to the square this if and only if my empirical risk and my expected risk are in interval zero one if they lie inside this interval okay that's something we can ensure that's something it's kind of easy to ensure basically we have to define that a hundred percent of error is going to be one and zero error is going to be zero so i will have the expected risk and the empirical risk in this interval okay this represents the sample size this is ensured as the sample size tends to infinity this is quite interesting you know what's interesting about this term the most interesting about it is that we can take advantage of that to understand what's happening remember here we have a probability of an a divergence given function f1 minus the empirical risk of f1 again greater than epsilon is smaller than or equal to two times the exponential of a minus two n epsilon to this to the square as n tends to infinity as my sample size tends to infinity remember this has to be in interval zero one and this also in interval zero one. this is ensured this is the law of large numbers this is the law of large numbers with an upper bound defined by the Chernoff bound this is called Chernoff's bound
okay this is a limit an upper limit an upper bound for this probability so if it's a limit for this probability let's consider my n is my sample size and it starts with one then two then it goes to ten thousand for example okay let's start with a given epsilon let's say my epsilon is equals to 0 0.01 0. Point, sorry 0 1 okay what that means that means that if this guy is in 0 1 and this is interval 0 1 2 the greatest divergence I accept is something smaller than 1% this turns out to be 1% as you guys may see because if this is interval 0 1, 0 1, the divergence has to be smaller than 1%. You know what's interesting about this? If I plot this exponential, it's a negative exponential function. Somehow I have like a value equals to 1 over here in y. And again, this is going to be my uh, probability. And the, this exponential will behave like this. Here I will have like 10,000 n equals 10,000. So this is my sample size n in this axis. And this is going to measure my probability. All oh, this probability. For example, let's consider a given scenario here with 10,000. And let's suppose, just suppose, I'm not computing here, just supposing, okay? That this probability here is 0.05 exactly 0 0.05 what that means to me that means that my probability of the expected risk for this single classification function f1 minus its empirical risk of the same function being greater than a given epsilon what's epsilon this epsilon that i selected 0 0.01 it is in here okay because i use it to plot the curve this curve okay here, this epsilon. Okay, it's going to be smaller than or equal to what? To 0 0.05. To 0 0.05. You know what that means? That's really, really interesting. This means basically that my probability, the probability of success. Why the probability of success? What is the probability of success? The probability of success is what is the probability that the divergence I have in between this expected risk and my empirical risk given F1 being smaller than or equal to 1%? This is going to be what? Take a look. The complement of this. It's going to be in 95% of the scenarios, I will have a divergence, a divergence in between my expected risk and my empirical risk, which is smaller than 1%. You know what's interesting about this, about the law of large numbers? I think now you guys can see that besides I cannot compute, besides I cannot compute the expected risk, I can have a way of finding a very nice estimative or estimator for the expected risk given function f1, given function f1. So I can have that estimator. The point, the point here is, let me just, okay, chain. Yeah, that's, that's better. So the point is, okay, if, I have to select the best as possible classification function inside some bias. And the bias is here. Here we have the universe with all functions. And here we have the bias, the algorithm bias. And I have to select from this space of admissible functions, the best function, which is the argument minimum of the, ex the expected risk given all functions that belong to that space and this is not computable because i should have access i should know i must have access to the joint probability distribution to compute this to compute the expected risk 
But I can't. I just can't because I don't have access to that joint probability distribution because I will receive data as it becomes available. I won't have access to every possibility. That's, that's kind of impossible if you deal with a real-world scenario. That's just impossible. How can come on, someone come with um, like every possibility uh, mapping X into Y and giving to you. If that person gives every possibility from the input space to the output space to you, it makes no sense to, to, to study the problem because all possibilities are, are available. And in this scenario, I, I expect you guys to notice that we could use the empirical risk the empirical risk to estimate this guy. So instead of computing this, we could compute something like this. We could have an approximation for the best function inside this bias by computing the argument minimum of empirical risk instead of the expected risk. That was Vapenik's idea, but there is a problem. There is a very, very strange problem happening here. You know which is the problem? The problem is this one. Let's suppose I decided to consider a space of admissible functions that considers lots of functions. When it considers more functions, of course, this bias is more complex. It represents not just the linear functions, but let's say it's capable of representing very, uh, so many polynomial functions, so many types of functions. And let's suppose someone gave me some input data set. And from that input data set, which of course contains inputs and expected outputs in pairs like this, another input with another expected output and so on, and that goes like up to n. Okay. If I were given that, of course, my idea is which is the best function inside this bias, but there is a problem. If I look for the argument minimum of empirical risk, I will most certainly face a serious problem. If I expect this to approximate the best classification function inside this bias, that's not going to work. You know why? Because if I have a very, a, a very large set of functions here, I could, I could have a memory function, or as we mentioned, a memory-based classification function, or simply classifier. What's that? That's basic, basically a function that's capable of overfitting my data set. It's capable of representing it completely without no, no mistake, no error, without a single mistake. And you know what's interesting about that? The empirical risk, of course, for that memory-based classifier is going to be zero in my training sample. I mean, in my training sample, I will make no mistake with that. It's like a hash table. If I, I came up with a hash table to memorize every input and provide the correct output, the correct outcome. But the problem is, what happens if I have that memory-based function inside this bias? What's going to happen is, my algorithm is going to adapt my classification function in terms of my data. And eventually, I will end up with this memory-based classifier. And if I end up with that, my empirical risk is going to be zero. But what happens with my expected risk? The question that stays is, is my empirical risk going to approach my expected risk for that memory-based, I'm going to call MB, memory-based classifier? No, that's not going to happen. You know why? Because just imagine, if I'm capable of memorizing, I'm going to make no mistake in my training sample. But what happens when I receive new samples, new examples that I've never seen before, 
I'm going to make lots of mistakes. So this empirical risk is going to be zero in my training sample, and this is going to be as high as possible in my um, in, in the, the example in, in function of examples I've never seen before. That's what's going to happen in this scenario. I, I yeah, that's not a good idea. So a problem that that stays here is I should have a way of understanding if I'm capable of approaching to this expected risk, given my empirical risk over here, and of course, given the space of demisible functions. So Vapni came with a very, very um, intelligent idea. He came up with something quite interesting, which is this. Okay, if I have, let's say I have a space with every possible function in the universe over here. And again, let's consider a bias, an algorithm bias containing, let's say this contains a limited set of function, functions. Let's say it contains m functions and m is a, fi a finite number. It's not, it's not, of course, an infinite number. Let's suppose it, okay? And let's suppose if I am working with the law of large numbers, I have some things that I must guarantee. First of all, I must sample data from a joint probability distribution in an independent and identical manner. Let's suppose I did it. My JPG must be fixed. Let's suppose it is. Let's suppose it doesn't change over time. Again, my function, my classification function, cannot be selected based on data. Cannot be selected based on data. Cannot be selected based on data. So what he did, based on data, what he did was, okay, if I cannot select based on data, I could select every function. <laughs> That's quite interesting. So he thought, okay, if I cannot select every, uh, I cannot select a given function inside that bias, what if I say, okay, I'm going to select the first function, and for the first function, I can indeed guarantee that my probability being greater than epsilon, of this divergence being greater than epsilon, is upper bounded by the turnoff bound, which is two times exponential value of minus two, minus two n epsilon to the square. Again, given this, it lies in interval zero one and this also. And this could be also guaranteed for, for sorry, the second function. Of course, if I select the second function with, without considering data, but just selecting the function like out of the blue without any analysis, without any data analysis. And I could carry on doing that for all functions that belong to that particular bias, to that particular space of diminishable functions. And I could go up to Fm, which is my last function inside that bias. Okay, I know you guys want to talk about an infinite number of functions, but let's start with a finite number of functions. It turns out to be easier. If you think what you're going to have in this is, take a look, I cannot guarantee, I cannot guarantee that for the best function inside my bias, but I can guarantee for every single function inside my bias. Okay, if I cannot guarantee for the best function inside this bias, but I can guarantee for function 1, function 2, and function m, because I selected those um, out of the blue without considering like any, any uh, data information, any a priori data information. So I could take advantage of this in some sense. I could say something like this. This is the same as the probability, as you guys may, may notice, the probability of selecting function 1 minus the empirical risk of function 1 being greater than epsilon or the second function, function 2. 
empirical risk of function 2, okay, being greater than epsilon, or function 3, function 4, or function, or the mth function, which is over here, of course, the mth function over here, okay? All that, as you guys can see, this is the same as the worst case scenario. This is the same as the worst case scenario. I can say that, okay, this turns out to be the same as the probability of the supreme, considering every function belonging to my bias, which in this scenario contains m functions. So, I'm going to consider the worst case, which is the supremum, considering every function inside my bias. This turns out to be the same, which is quite interesting, isn't it? So, this is the same, and that's really nice. Another point that I suppose you guys must, must see, which is, if here I am considering, okay, this is equal to this, and there is something else. Let's suppose, let's use like some, some sets, some diagrams using sets or subsets to explain this. If I have one classification function given, given like some result over here, another here, and the mth classification function over here, maybe they share some similarities and maybe they don't. If they don't share similarities, I would have some th something like subsets that don't intersect each other. But if they share similarities, I would have something like this, sharing some regions, uh, of course, in between or among all those subsets. Of course, if I consider this as a probability of selecting this classification function, or the second, or the, the third, or fourth, or the nth classification function, and they share some similarities, this is going to be upper bounded by the sum, the sum of the, their probabilities, the sum of single probabilities, the probability of the first classification function minus its empirical risk or empirical error of this first function greater than epsilon. This is quite interesting. If all those classification functions don't intersect, this is going to be equal and not less than or equal. If they intersect, this is going to be greater than the worst case. So, of course, if this is going to be greater, that's why we have smaller than or equal over here. Because maybe some classification functions share some um, structures, some mathematical structures. That's going to happen, actually, in, in many, many scenarios, okay? So, from this, I have, like, some very, very interesting results. And this is probably, this, this starts to be the most interesting results after the, the statistical learning theory. So the worst case scenario, again, the worst case scenario is like, what, the, what, what is the worst scenario I have for a given bias, for a given space of demissible functions? The worst case is upper bounded by the sum of all probabilities from 1 to m, given the probability of every divergence of a given classification function minus its empirical risk f of i greater than epsilon. Okay, so it's smaller than or equal this uh, this bound, but this is, actually we have a solution for this. Take a look. If I am summing up, if I sum, I am summing up all those terms on the left side, I can sum up all those terms on the right side. And by summing up all those terms on the, the right side, of course, this guy is going to be smaller than or equal to the sum from 1 to m of 2 times the exponential value of minus 2 n epsilon to the square. And this turns out to be the same as 
2 times m times the exponential of minus 2 n epsilon squared. This is one of the most important steps that Vopnik did in order to, to have in order to have the statistical learning theory. This is one of the most, most important steps I can guarantee to you guys. You know what's interesting about this? I can just make it shorter now. I can just make this much, much shorter. What I'm guaranteeing with this bound is this. If and only if my, jo my joint probability distribution is fixed, I mean, it does not change over time. Of course, it cannot change if I want to, to provide some convergence guarantee on something that I receive data a long time or receive data along the collection. And if data changes its, be its behavior, how could I ensure some convergence? It makes no sense. So the JPD has to be fixed. Secondly, Every sample or every example I sample from my JPD has to be sampled in an NIID fashion, as I mentioned before. If I ensure that and I ensure that, or I assume those, okay, by assuming I can give a next step. My next step is, remember, my classification function cannot be selected cannot be selected based on data, based on data. But I have a problem here. Typically, when we work with machine learning, we select classification functions, we adapt classification functions as data becomes available. And that's a problem because my algorithm is going to bias towards data. When Vapnik came up and said, okay, let's consider a space containing all the universe and a bias of my algorithm. And when he decided, okay, let's consider the worst, worst case scenario, which is exactly this, the worst case scenario. This means if I select, given all, every, every possible function inside this bias, what is or which is the function that provides the worst result for me, the greatest divergence for me? You see, the greatest divergence inside this bias is this scenario. And this is going to be upper bounded by what? By 2 times m times the exponential of a minus 2n epsilon to the square. You know what's interesting about this? Is that Vapnik solved this problem with this worst case scenario just addressing the worst case scenario he solved the scenario uh, I mean when we talk of course about about selecting any function inside the bias of course if we change you, you guys are gonna see now like we're gonna discuss about this if I increase this m, if I have a very, very large number of functions inside my bias, what's going to happen? What's going to happen, for example, if my bias over here has, for example, just consider two scenarios. Let's suppose my m is equals to n to the, uh, to the square, and let's consider m being equal to 2 powered 2n. Two different scenarios over here. And let's understand what's going to happen with this upper bound over here. This scenario is the same as, okay, my bias, it changes as I receive more data. If I have just a single observation, I will have one power to two functions inside my bias. If I had two observations, or two examples in my data sample, I will have two power to two. I will have four functions inside this. But is it possible to change my bias in terms of data I have? Yes, and we're going to see that later. Just assume, just suppose that, okay? Please, just suppose that. We're going to discuss that really 
as, uh, as fast as possible, okay? Just suppose that. And here we have something very different. If I have like eight examples in my, in my data set, I will have two power to eight functions inside my bias. Here, you're gonna see that the number of functions I have in my, in my bias grows polynomially. And here, it grows exponentially, the number of functions I have in my bias. This is the same as having an algorithm that defines a, a bias that's more restricted, a bias that is just has a, a smaller set of functions. And this is the same as defining a bias which contains an amazing number of functions. Okay? It tends to have the whole universe of functions on the right side over here. Okay? So if I go for this upper bound, I can substitute and do something like this. 2 times n oops, sorry guys, 2 multiplied by n to the square times the exponential of minus 2n epsilon to the square. As you guys may notice, this is the same as 2 times, I'm going to apply exponential and log in this guy over here. So I have exponential of log of n to the square. This is the same as n to the square, of course, because this cancels with this, okay? Times exponential of minus 2 n epsilon to the square. Of course, if I carry on here, I can, I have the same basis here, I can sum up. If I sum up, I will have 2 times exponential of what log of n to the square minus 2 n epsilon to the square. Okay, I carry on. If I carry on, using one of the properties, the log properties, I can have 2 times exponential of 2 multiplied by log of n minus 2 n epsilon to the square. This is a very nice result. Why? Here I have something that's negative, something that's positive. But here, the negative is in terms of a linear function of n, and here, of a log function of n. Which term is going to domain, dominate this, the negative term? If the negative term just takes over, what's going to happen is a curve, a, probabili a probabilistic curve like this. As I increase my sample size, my right side term is going to operate in terms of probability conversion to zero as my sample size increases. What's going to happen over here? Oof, over here we've got a problem actually. Because here we're going to have 2 times 2 power to n multiplied by the exponential of minus 2 n epsilon to the square. And here I'm going to apply the exponential of log of 2 power to n, okay? Multiplied by the exponential of 2 n epsilon to the square as before. This is equals, okay. Here I can sum up because I have the same basis, which is exponential. Exponential of log of 2 power to n minus 2 n epsilon to the square, and this is the same as 2 times exponential of n log of 2 minus 2 n epsilon to the square. You know what's interesting here? This is a positive term, this is a negative term. Problems. The negative has to take over. Otherwise, I won't have this kind of convergence towards zero it would be impossible to have this convergence. And you know what's interesting? Log of 2 is approximately is 6, 0, 6. So I have something like 0, 6 times my sample size, and here, epsilon. Remember, epsilon is always a very small number, like 1%, or like 2%, or like 5% at most. Maybe it could be 10%, but not like 60%. It makes no sense. So, of course, I am 
I am, I am of course powering up up to two so this is going to reduce it even more if I'm going to reduce it, it even more and multiply by n and this has a 0 0.6 what's going to hap happen is the positive term of my exponential is going to dominate so what's going to happen here I have no convergence my curve is going to behave like this as my sample size tends to infinity and that in terms of this probability I have in this axis you know what's interesting over here just okay open up another page you know what's really nice over here and that's a very important conclusion after Vapnik which is the worst case scenario I have here, which is the supremum, considering every function inside my bias, in terms of the absolute difference I have, in terms, of course, of my expected risk and my empirical risk, being greater than epsilon is smaller than or equal to 2 times m times exponential of minus 2 and epsilon to the square. What is interesting here? If my bias, let's, let's draw like this, if my bias is very restricted like this, I have, I will have a given behavior. If my bias is not restricted, on the contrary, it is very relaxed. relaxed. I will have, of course, many more possibilities here. And here, less possibilities. If I have too many, too many possibilities. Just keep that in mind for now. If I have more possibilities than the necessary number of possibilities I need to solve my problem, what's going to happen over here is that my m, which is referred to as shattering coefficient, we're going to understand how it is computed and how it works, okay? Just later. Actually, this guy is going to increase a lot if I have a bias like this. And if I, I have a, a restricted bias, of course, this is going to grow polynomially. So here I have a, an M that grows polynomially and here an M that grows exponentially. So, of course, over here I have some sort of, of convergence in terms of this right hand term and over here I won't have it it will behave like this like an exponential function the the question that stays here is how can I compute this how can I compute this guy over here this shattering coefficient Vapnik evolved that a lot actually to compute m you know what he did? He did something like this. He decided to come up with a very interesting way of computing the shattering coefficient function, actually. It's a function, okay? Let's give the right name, a shattering coefficient function. That shattering coefficient function, m, is not actually just a constant m, but it is, in fact, a function that depends on my sample size. Why? Just imagine. Imagine I have here a plane and I have a single example and this example can be classified as positive or as negative. So if I have just a single example I could classify it what is the number of classifications of possible classifications I have possible classifications I have two possibilities it could be positive or negative of course I am assuming as mentioned before just a binary classification problem guys we can generalize later okay just a binary problem if now I have two examples and a single hyperplane just one hyperplane let's say the hyperplane is here if the hyperplane is here let's say all those points are positive 
it, if it lies here, they are negative. So I have two possibilities already. But of course, the, the hyperplane could be here. And I could have positive, negative, or the opposite. So if I have two points, I could have four possibilities. If I have three points on the plane, on the plane, again, on R2, how many possibilities I have? If I have three points and they are not collinear, they do not lie on, on a line, if they are not collinear, how many possibilities? They could be all positive if my hyperplane is here, all negative if my hyperplane is here, positive negatives or negative positives if my hyperplane is here, positive negatives, negative negatives and positives if my hyperplane is here, and other two cases if it lies here. So if I have three points, I could have eight possibilities. Okay? What happens if I have four points? If I have four points on the plane, I want you guys to notice and try with a single, try with a single hyperplane to produce 16 possibilities. You cannot. If you work on R2, you are going to have not 16, but 14 possibilities. You know why? Because the space is going to limit the number of possibilities. And that's so beautiful, so beautiful. If you go for five, you're going to notice that this is around like 22. I think it's 22. Yeah. What you guys are going to notice, and Vopnik did notice, of course, is, is that when you select an input space with two features like this one, let's say this had like one feature and a second feature over here, okay? Two features. You are going to have something, of course, a function, a shattering coefficient function that grows exponentially up to a number. In this case, the number is a sample size equals to three. And then it starts growing polynomially. After three examples in my space, in my input space, it turns out to behave in a polynomial way. This is the shattering coefficient function. Actually, most, most papers give a different notation, but it doesn't matter. We could use this notation. This is the function we are talking about. Just imagine what happens if and only if it doesn't matter. I come up with more examples and I'm still capable of providing every possible classification for that sample. If I am capable of providing every possible classification, I can indeed find a perfect classification for my sample. So I will have the memory-based classifi classifier in that particular space. I will have it. So if I have the memory-based classifier in my space, what's going to happen is I cannot ensure learning. I cannot ensure learning because I cannot ensure this upper bound. So I want you guys at this point to notice exactly this, exactly this. By considering this supreme of every function belonging to my bias, to, to the algorithm bias, given my expected risk minus my empirical risk of f is greater than epsilon, is upper bounded by two times my shattering coefficient times exponential of minus, minus 2 n epsilon to the square. Remember, this is valid as n tends to infinity. This is valid if this guy over here lies in interval 0, 1, this also in 0, 1 interval. Again, my joint probability distribution has to be static. It cannot change a long time as I receive more data. Again, every example I sampled from my JPD has to be independent. We'll discuss that. You're going to see. You're going to see. So this is the foundation of the statistical learning theory.
you know what we have enough here for for uh, yeah actually we have a lot here let's open up like just some terms this guy over here is the shattering coefficient as i mentioned before shattering coefficient we still have some things over here we could solve we could find like some some additional solutions okay after this formulation actually vapnik applied something called the symmetrization lemma symmetrization lemma the symmetrization lemma gave a different perspective a different perspective on this formulation after after this symmetrization lemma we can come up with some adaptations over here but for now i'm not worried about that at this point i just recommend you guys to do something take this foundation go to the paper by luxburg luxburg and shokov I never know how to write his name. Shokov. I think it's like this. It is in, in our references, of course. It is a very nice paper about the statistical learning theory. Statistical learning theory, concepts, models, and whatever. Concepts, models, and whatever. Read it. After reading this paper, you come back, watch this video again and then you're gonna go to actually i'm going to open this symmetrization lemma in the next video okay guys see you